Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And it is the Wednesday extravaganza of JHS. That means it's not only Judd. It is Declan as well and Jesse Pierce, our friend from the Bar Down Beauties. Check out that outstanding podcast. Also, check out Jesse's work, NHL.com. She covers the Wild. Uh, she covers the team on a daily basis. She is around these players asking the hard questions and giving opinions that sometimes might rub them the wrong way, but that's too damn bad because you got to talk about what you see. <laughs> and hey, guys, let's start Let's start with this. So there, there's actually quite a bit to get to because the Wild, once again, from the grave, their arm is out. We're not dead yet. We're not dead. You know, you always get to the end of Scream, right? And it's like, that's it for Scream. And then here comes the Wild. We're not dead. Hello, Sydney. So <laughs> anyway... Hello, it's Jesse. true. It's he like, just Hello, Jesse. We're not done yet. It's like <laughs> Ryan Hartman. We're not done yet. Hello. Yeah. Let's God. play a game. Do you want to play a game? <laughs> now it's we're called... crossing genres. Now you're going into uh, Saw. Oh, I thought that was uh, Scream. No. Let's play, let's play a game. Is, is Saw. Play a game is Saw. Oh, I thought I thought they did that. Tell me your favorite scary movie is Scream. Okay. So there's okay. a game element. Not a Saw my fan. Netflix. Not a Saw fan. So um, it's a little gruesome. I remember Vikings players in the early 2000s love Saw. Like a new oh, Saw came out. Yeah. Culpepper was like, I got to go see that right away. It's like, it's, it's pretty gruesome. It's the, first, the first few are, are pretty effed up, but it's more of a, I, it's gruesome, but it's also more of a psychological horror yeah. film built into the gruesome too. It's, so it's just, not just mm-hmm. Saws. It's much more than that. I love yes. Scream. So I mean, I was a huge Scream like one and two fan. I thought they were just fantastic. Well, and those are supposed to be, that was supposed to be a comedy. Like that yes. was supposed yeah. to be a like, fluke mm-hmm. on scary movies and people got like scared. Yep. And yeah. but, but it worked. So anyway, let's talk about this. Uh, and <laughs> actually, if you would like to read more about this, uh, Jesse has a piece posted at um, NHL.com right now, and I'm sure it's at Wild.com as well. Marat Hustadinov, the Russian player who came over here now, um, I believe he was, what, a 2020 or 2022 draft pick? 2020, Jesse, is that right? 2020. By the yeah, Wild? five years. Yep. Um, he did not make his uh, – he's here now. He did not make his debut in the win over Arizona on Tuesday. It sounds like he might – make it Thursday against the Ducks, especially since Jules Eriksson Eck was injured in that game and we don't know his status. Uh, one is, uh, before we get into the main topic here, Jess, do you have an update on Eriksson Eck? And then I want to talk about what Hustadinov might bring to this team. Um, no, I need to publicly apologize. Literally in this week's episode of Bard on Beauties, I just said, hey, you know what's great is Jewel Eric Snack, one of the few players not to be injured yet this year. That dropped yesterday, and then so did oh Jewel Eric Snack. So I apologize. <laughs> Jinxes are real, in my opinion. Uh, no, John Hines was very quick to say no update, and the curtness and the way he said no update, because we have to read between the lines, didn't give me promise that Jewel would be playing tomorrow night against the Anaheim Ducks. Now, I don't know that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Minnesota Wild canceled practice today, as is going to be the tendency, I imagine, for the next couple weeks here. But uh, we'll know more tomorrow at Morning Skate. But I still am trying to struggle to figure out what the injury actually was. I watched the sequence because I just happened to be looking down that way. And at first it looked like it was his stomach or... God forbid, um, a ball shot, if you will. I don't know if I can say that, but there that's you. kind of what I was. Uh... It's a podcast, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like groin would be a groin. groin would be the adult <clears throat> thing to say, but yes. ball shot is a fair ball game. shot. But that's what it kind and, of looked like. We, the way he, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, right, and the guys even behind me who do the shot calling were like, "Oh, that looks like it hurt," and the way they reacted made it seem like, "Oh." That was probably to the the nads there, um, and then the fact that Ryan Hartman had to grab X stick to kind of pull him off, and then he got assistance down. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know that it was lower body. It feels more upper body. Um, I've seen a couple clips where it looked like maybe a shoulder situation. Again, mm. not a bad hit from Nick Bukestad necessarily. Just right. got him in the wrong way, but I don't know the severity of it to answer the question. Okay, so what will? Marat, in your opinion, bring potentially. And if Eriksson does not play, where do you think he slots in since it's going to open up a center position? If Eck doesn't play, that's where things get really curious, right? I think Marat was probably going to make his debut tomorrow regardless just because they need to get 
him in some, some games now that he's practiced. Now he's still going to enter having only one real practice with the Minnesota Wild team. He had an optional skate. He's done a morning skate. Um, but, you know, he really hasn't been on the ice a heck of a whole lot with this squad. So bear with him on that. Um, I could see him probably being a third liner, right? Maybe a fourth liner. You saw Adam Beckman come out because Marcus Johansson returned yesterday. Um, I could see Marco Rossi moving up. I could see Hartman going back to a center. I mean, really, there are some possibilities, and I think John Hines will definitely play around with it. Nothing that I love because I don't love not having a Jules Eriksson neck in your lineup, even if this kid is the next star centerman. It's just I don't love not having it. So it'd be curious, but I see him slotting in as a third liner, regardless of what might happen with, with Jewel. What do you guys gauge to like, what, what is the real temperature for his expectations? You know, like when Kirill got here, obviously it was, it was huge and he delivered immediately tenfold and Eck, there was a bit of a slow build, right. For him to get to the player that he is now. I'm trying, I'm just trying to pinpoint from past examples. What should our expectations be for him? Because if he is obviously hits his ceiling and is just as good as advertised from from his time overseas, I mean, oh my God, now they've added like another insane layer to this roster, right? That kind of has fallen in their laps. But should we probably temper those? I think that's where I'm trying to lean because it's probably unfair of us to just assume, to Jesse's point, that we, even with the injuries to act, that he's just going to step in and he's going to be this, you know, 50 to 60 point guy a season. Maybe he eventually gets there. I'm just tr- I'm just having a tough time trying to project what type of player and what type of impact he's going to make. I mean, the big the big tout about him or surrounding him is is his speed and his stick handling. You know, I chatted with Kirill Kaprizov, who's never actually played with Marat because they're about five years apart in age. So he was in juniors while Kaprizov was in the KHL. Um, and Kaprizov even said he's never seen him in person from what he's seen on TV. He said he really liked the way that he played. And, you know, he's talked to some friends who who know him and, and said that he seems like a really good player. But it is, it's his speed and his stick handling. That all being said, I, you know, in talking with Marat the first time he was introduced a couple days ago, great personality. Like he did almost his entire interview in English with just a couple check-ins. And he had the smile just like Kirill constantly has. He's very excited. But it's also, especially with his debut, that excitement I think could get in the way just a little bit, right? Because it's his first NHL game and he's allowed to have that. Um, Even Kaprizov had joked, you know, it's going to be better than my debut, which was in front of no fans and no crowd because he debuted uh, during the COVID year. So I think you're right, Dex. Got to temper the expectations with all of those things going into it as well, right? I mean, he's not coming in to be the savior at this point. There should not be that expectations. He was a second round pick for Minnesota in 2020. So obviously that comes with a little bit higher of a ceiling than maybe even Kaprizov had at the time because Kaprizov, let's remember, fifth rounder. Um, So naturally that comes with its own rights. But I think he's definitely going to be a good player. I think he's probably going to be a top six forward for sure. Not this year, maybe not even quite next year. Just again, while they still try to get some of those older guys out on the outs and outs but I think he's going to be a good player I'm excited to see him in person because even Kirill we go back I wanted to see Kirill in person before making an official judgment and that kid was everything so I'm excited to see a little bit more of Marat's in-game action I love the, the fact that he's going to get a chance to play now though and like get you know uh get in- integrated into National Hockey League life get see the game um I will I will say this before he was traded and he, he was not terrible here to the Sochi team in, in the KHL. I mean, his stats were incredible. I saw him in the world juniors a couple of years ago. And I mean, he is legit fast. I think he could be very good. He's not big. The one thing that I really liked Jess and you, you were there as you just said, I was not, but the one thing I really, really liked are two things about his introductory press conference slash talking to you guys was one, the fact that he went Ovechkin and basically said, screw it. I'm going to do as much as I can in English and there are two very different types of Russians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's the Kaprizov type, and I'm not criticizing it, but there's the Kaprizov type, the Malkin type. They do not, you know, they'll eventually start to admit that they know some. And then there's the sort of cocky guys who are just like, ah, uh-uh, I'm I'm here now. I'm I'm going to speak. I, I can speak some or very limited English, but I'm going to do it the best I can. But the other thing I loved was he has that devilish look about him like that <laughs> hockey, but it's, but not bad, but like that, you know, Kirill sort of has this odd geez, shucks grin. Um, but it's, it's not like Mr. Confident. It's just like Kirill. Um, Marat has had that sort of just smirky cocky grin. Like, I think this kid's not going to be afraid to mix things up. 
and I and and he's not big, but I love the personality because if that personality translates to the ice, I think he's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, he's he's supposed to be a tenacious player, and and you're right, it's kind of funny. He uh, he had told media in English that he he missed dinner with Kirill Kaprizov, right? He he overslept. He said, "I went to lunch with Kirill, and he told me maybe go sleep an hour." Well, I slept four or five hours. <laughs> now, granted, that's all part of the travel. I mean, the kid had three flights, sixteen hours yeah. of travel, uh, and then I brought that up jokingly to Kirill, and Kirill jokingly responded back, "Yeah." No respect from that kid. <laughs> like, so it is. I mean, you're right. I'm excited to see what he Because the interesting thing is he doesn't have the size. I feel like in the glimpses, I thought he was maybe bigger than what he is. He's a little bit smaller. So if he is kind of have that feisty attitude, in addition to the speed and stick handling that's so promoted, um, he could be a really good, well-rounded player, a good two-way guy, too. So I think it could be really exciting. Uh, to see again, I'm just excited to have him get the opportunity, as you said, Judd. Now versus waiting and and waiting his time on the AHL too much. Mm-hmm. I think what uh, surprises about Kirill, and this is probably the toughest thing to quantify when guys come from the KHL, which is probably obviously the second best professional hockey league in the world next to the NHL, or maybe you could say it's better, but I certainly wouldn't. It's their skating. So Husadinov might be quick as hell, which is fine but does his skating translate to the NHL game? I think that's what blew my mind about Kirill when I finally saw him in person. I was like, oh my God, this, mm-hmm. yes, he has a great shot. Yes, he's quick, but he's a hell of a skater. He's an ox. He's tough to move off the puck. I think that that transition, which is always something we, we look at points and we look at shot, and obviously those are the sexiest things, but does his skating play at an NHL level? And I think that's what I'm most curious to see if it fits. You know, another interesting thing, too, that probably hasn't been talked enough about it, that's one of his weapons that Marat himself had said, and even Kaprizov, is the vision in his on-ice hockey sense. That's another thing he said. That's one Marat himself said that he thinks that will really translate is the way that he sees the game, and that's another thing that Kirill Kirill had said was he has a really good on-ice vision, which will be great. I mean, again, if you are looking to maybe get him with Kirill and you know god forbid maybe zuki or what you know just imagine the playmaker. i know judd i'm sorry was that gross pass the puck back and <laughs> forth Boldies but it, you on know, the bench. <laughs> but it, it could be fun but maybe you just put oh, a speed up there could be bulls. great i yeah. look i am all i am all for speed mm-hmm. especially at that spot um let's talk about uh, Kirill for a second though because so Kirill kaprizov clearly started the season hurt um, he was not himself for, a, I think, a good two months at least, if not more. He got hurt against the Jets, missed some time. Last night, and, and yes, he scored two goals, the second one into an empty nickel. But he has 33 goals and I believe 73 points now. Let's just consider that for a second because I, I think there was a long time on this podcast we talked about that it felt like a down year. Like, it, we didn't rip him, but my point is it didn't feel like a career year. It's really nice to have a player where at the end of the year, you're like, you know, that wasn't his best. And then you look and it's 33 goals Mm -hmm. and it's going to be more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, the wild has so rarely had this type of talent, right? Where, where you've got a player who you're like, man, he's not what he was or he's not what it, and then you look and it's like, okay, that's pretty damn good. Still. I, I just think there, there needs to be, including for me, an appreciation for what this guy basically does night in, night out. And the fact that I thought last night, I know what the players said, I know what John Hines said. I thought last night was a subpar performance. I felt like the Coyotes were begging the Wild to kick their ass the first period. This team is checked out. And the Wild sort of kept them in the game. They're like, oh, no, no, we'll shoot wide 15 times. We'll do this or that. And it felt to me, I'm not, not sure how, how you guys uh, felt about this, felt to me like Kaprizov's like, if I got to do it, I'll do it. And <laughs> yeah. just took the game, had the assist on the Hartman goal, had the first goal, had the empty net goal. Um, that's quite a testament to a guy who we spent about two months saying, I wonder what's wrong. Yeah, I mean, Kirill is breaking records, continues to shatter all of these franchise records that have been in place since Marion Gabrick, right? For good reason. He's just out there doing his thing. And he is. it's more even the way that he's, 
doing it because I think he quietly started coming back around right you do you look at the stats and it really hasn't been as bleak as we like to think as grim as it looked at the beginning of the year um and I I forgot what a heck of a shot he has too like my god it's it can be just absolutely lethal you know especially because again we've talked about his skating is is bar none it's incredible but sometimes you forget how good of a shot he has that quick release and that snap that he can do and you've seen that particularly the past two games but you're right Judd I mean and it's an last night I think is another example of the way that he carried this team I've seen that so much lately and it's got to be frustrating as hell for him because it's like come on guys I mean we talk about the bottom six lacking in scoring right but you're also having Matt Boldy struggle a little bit yes he gets the game winner in overtime but all I could think of was the coach Bombay saying keep swinging Boldy maybe you'll give him a cold because he is fanning on shot after shot after shot lately and now granted it's great to see him doing it but yeah Kirill has been everything that this team needs and you know he's on pace for another 40 goal season which is another franchise record for consecutive years and it's just it's incredible and and it's fun because you know we talked post game with Mark andre Fleury and he said it's nice because you see Kirill smiling again and joking and he's playing looser because he's playing good I mean there is that correlation that can't be forgotten when you're playing poorly you're going to be naturally gripping the stick and I think that's why the points weren't coming so Kirill's back to his old old self and unfortunately he's just not getting much help in in the department from other lines yeah the first 20 games of the season just six goals the shooting percentage too was like criminally low at 8.6 percent which is below league average and, and below a goal scorers type of percentage as well and you know we didn't really we had a good idea but when you know dean basically went on his media tour post being axed that said yeah he's not he's not he's not healthy he's he's hurting he's he's not 100 percent. that is 100 percent why he's you know had such a slow start and then in the 39 games since then 27 goals so 27 goals in a 39 game run which is absurd um and to judd's point now all of a sudden he's quietly has 33 and he'll get 40 again like Mm -hmm. he's gonna get 40 again which which is amazing considering he only had six goals in the first you know fourth of the season so we've had a little bit too of this problem with Kirill where we get we panic the first you know two months of the season because he only has this this is like the fourth time this has happened too injury mm-hmm. or just slow start that he does is a notorious slow starter and there's no need to panic so i'm letting us know now that on november 28th of 2024 eight mo- six eight months from now let's not completely freak out when Kirill only has four or five goals i'll try to remember this and bookmark this and replay this to remind us I think what panicked me though was how he looked because you could tell he was hurt. Like, because we we never like ripped him for not trying, which God knows there's a bunch of this team that that we could rip, <clears throat> Marcus Johansson. But you know, when you look beyond that, like we were just like he doesn't look right. Like he didn't look right. He couldn't. Uh, it it looked like d- down to his skating, like his skating because it's usually so precise and so tight. It didn't look as tight. So I was like, how long is this going to to take? But yeah, he he's been fantastic. Um, Jesse, what would you call the situation and goal now? The Flowers started back-to-back games. Gustafson, to his credit, gave up the early goal against the Abs on Friday, but he came back and played well. Um, it feels like, and and I forget if it was you or Sarah who pressed John Hines last night on, on this at the press conference, it feels like, though, that there is a definite leaning towards Flurry. And just to be very clear, if this keeps up, I don't blame him. But... But what would you or how would you characterize what we're seeing in goal right now? I mean, yeah, <clears throat> all the credit to Sarah for for pushing that a little bit last night on Heinz because it does. It seems like Marc-Andre Fleury, as I've been telling you, Judd, he's he's kind of the number one. He's had to come in and claim that role, she injury aside fired. from Gustafson throughout this year. But just in general, he's more consistent. I can count on Flower to play better than Gustafson can. Yes, Gus had a, a great game last time, um, but Flower's just been better as a whole. And, you know, so the big question is, is he ready for that? Can he do that? Yes, he's been doing that for most of his career, but that was not the expectation this year. The expectation was for him to be a backup. And, you know, Mark Andre told us last night, well, yeah, of course I, I love to play. And I do, I think he's physically ready to do that too, because I think him like anybody else in that room wants to make the playoffs. And as he said, I want to be able to contribute and be a part of making this playoff push. Um, yeah. Gus is just, it's, it's curious, you know, Heinz was very adamant saying that they are going to use both goalies down the stretch and the way that the schedule is designed, you're going to have to right? like, I bet you look at Gus against the ducks tomorrow, but putting flower in against um, St. Louis on Saturday, 
that's very telling at what you think about this tandem. That obviously, again, puts Flower ahead of, of Gus, I think. Um, now, I think it's probably going to be a game-by-game situation, too, and see who is looking better because I think you're going to have to choose when you look at your Vegas games, when you look at that Colorado game. Again, those big, tough ones that you have to win. I'm sorry, you have to. There's no question. Um, you're going to have to look at who's been performing better, and if that's Flower, you're going to have to scratch your whole tandem idea and go with who's the better goalie. It is interesting since Mark andre has been acquired, which is now almost, what, two years ago to the day or coming up on it that he's been here for two years after being acquired from the Blackhawks the trade deadline. The yin-yang of our expectation and where is he the number one or is he the 1B or is he a 2? You know, when he got here, they needed a clear upgrade from their goaltending unit. Um, so they have him in Cam Talbot going back and forth a bit. And then last year, it feels like, okay, Gustin comes out of nowhere and he's the number one starter, but we're still going to rotate them in game two of the playoffs, which I will still go down as one of the dumbest decisions Dean Evison ever made um, in his wild tenure. And now you enter the season as Fleury as clearly as the backup to Gustafson. And here we are in March with this team trying to crawl back from the grave in the playoffs where it's clear as day that Marc-Andre Fleury is now the better goaltender. So there's always the, the inconsistencies and unpredictable nature of that position. But it is interesting that for two straight years, he has been battling with one or two other guys to try to solidify his case on where he ranks as the number one or the number two on this team. Mm -hmm. Odds that you guys think that that in July, Gustafson will be traded and and that at some point in time, Fleury will actually come back to be Volstead's backup. Declan? I I think that plan only happens is if Marc-Andre Fleury inks an extension early early sure. they they can't they can't sure. go into what you're suggesting with the idea that mark andre is still a ufa and they could leave him no no i'm saying like let's say yeah. that's done and then in mm-hmm. july you trade gus yep yeah i, I right. would i would envision that if they're able to convince mark andre to play for another year or two or whatever it looks like uh and that's again before free agency starts then yes it, it's a foregone conclusion they would probably trade gus to obtain a you know day two if you will pick in the nhl draft because at that point Volstead needs to play. Great, great transition plan for Mark Andre Fleury in the Volstead. So yes, if they have if they extend Mark Andre, then I would see Gus probably playing elsewhere by next season. Yeah, I certainly see it more, and I like it more uh, than when you first approached the subject a couple weeks ago, Judd. Like the more I see it, I'm like, yep. There's just I don't trust Philip Gustafson in that, and I don't trust him to be the right mentor that you might need for Jesper Velstead. Even Velstead gets the lion's share of starts next year, which he should and, and probably will. I'd rather have Marc-Andre Fleury being the guy there to back him up or get him ready for that starting position. I just, I think that makes a lot more sense. Just the way that the season's played out, right? I mean, it just, it is. Unfortunately, Gustafson has kind of turned out to be the goalie that we all were worried he might be, but we didn't want to see it. And now it's, it's kind of there in our faces. So I think a move makes a lot of sense this off season for Gus. And just from like listening um, after the game last night to Fleury, Jesse, I'm not convinced he wants a he he wants to quit. Like he's having uh, a lot of fun. I mean, he is a locker room guy. Like you could tell, he absolutely loves it. You know, you can't go go home and prank your wife. <laughs> um, he just seems like a guy who he doesn't seem like a guy who's at his wits end. And I mean, he's not on that. You know, it's not like this is a, a great team too. So it's not like it's not like I'm trying to decide should I walk away from a first place team, right? Like mm-hmm. this team has struggled and he still seems like he loves it. Like he's having fun. I just become more and more convinced with his demeanor and personality that if he thinks there's something left there. And I mean, certainly Bill Guerin would love him back. I'm sure it just makes a lot of sense. I just, you know, you can tell when a season like this wears on a player and to Flurry's credit, I really don't see that type of wear. No, I don't. And he loves the competition. It is. It's a huge decision to decide to walk away from a career, right? It was suffice to say uh, he's got his family to consider. I did hear tell that his kids were enrolled here in Minnesota for next year, if that's anything at oh, all. Oh, you breaking news! Oh, Br- huge! Show. When you can move kids around, no first. problem. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that could be an inkling, right? I mean, yeah. it's if, if that comes to to be true that kind of shows you a little bit more of where his head at because I think you're right Judd he is he's having a good time you know I even asked him I said 
you want to obviously be in the playoffs. And generally, he's always been in a team that has the position where they're not curious to where they're going to fall. It's the difference between maybe being one, two, or three, right? They don't really find themselves too often in this kind of fighting for jockeying for spots. And he's like, I don't know. I kind of like this too, though. Like, he's kind of having fun being a part of trying to make a push. He's like, of course you like having the a lot luxury. A people don't but like this. Yeah, he kind of, he's digging it. And I, I can appreciate that about that man, right? Like, he wants to fight and... You know, I think he mentioned a couple games ago, there's still a lot of pride in that room, whether they're in the playoffs or not. So I think he's a big part of that. So I'd love to have him back, but that's because he's like my favorite. Unless oh, John Gibson wants to come play here, then I don't goalie know. Goalie fight last night. He They got Mar- ejected Marazic. for just skating up to the line. And Morazic attacked a, t- a, a Ducks yeah. player. So yeah. Gibby, length of the ice, yes. to go after Morazic. John yes. Gibson, Ducks, just trade the poor guy, please, please. <sighs> Get him to another. Yeah. yeah. So, so your team is Gibson, R O R. Yep. Ryan O'Reilly fan didn't know didn't know, know that <laughs> till Sunday when she came upstairs and said <laughs> Ryan O'Reilly talked to us. Great. He's so great. Yeah. Um, last player I, I want to talk about is this. What Declan? What do you think? What when it comes to Ryan Hartman? Okay. So Ryan Hartman is playing really well again now. And he has two goals in his last two games. He went 20 games without a goal. But but above and beyond that, because I don't expect him to sc- Like, it's nice when he scores and he can score. But when he's playing well, he plays a smart game. He stays out of the box. Like, these are repeatable things that disappear at times. What is your dime store theory on where that guy goes? So he doesn't have to score a bunch. But when he's playing dumb, he hurts the team. Yep. And when he's playing smart and tough... He is a major asset. Yeah, he's a huge contributor when he's playing playing the right way. I just, he, uh, you know, you you bring up Marcus Johansson, and he is by far a better and, and more important asset to this team than Johansson. But I just, I I don't buy it. And I know Hines was all praising him last night, rightfully so. When he has his stick and he's in the right place, he can really basically interfere with a lot of different situations that tilt the ice in the Wilds' favor. But it's just too inconsistent for me. And that's why I didn't understand the extension. I was fine with his role as a, as a bottom six kind of guy with this random pop upness to him two years ago offensively. And he's finally, you know, he's probably more in the middle of that kind of player now. But I, I'm glad Hines praised him. He had a good game. But is he going to keep that up for games on games on games? I have significant doubts of that. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat as as Dex. I do. You guys know I love love Ryan Hartman. I love his so grizzled. Right. Just he's so surly, but I can dig that, right? I get it counters my peppy and happy positivity. It reminds me that the world has a little bit of darkness in it too. Oh yeah, that is Ryan Hartman. I mean, the biggest thing that I could take away, and I I kind of understood the praise, but even then I didn't. Like Heinz was really swooning for Hartsey, and granted the questions were given to him too, so I I get it. But the only thing that I really am liking, aside from the goals is him just staying out of the box. That's been my biggest point of contention from Ryan Hartman is that he just put Minnesota in such a tough spot so many times because he lets his emotions get the best of him in the worst possible way uh, with just stupid, stupid penalties. Um, So I'm glad to see that. But yeah, ultimately, I don't know that Again, you're going to also see this Ryan Hartman resurgence because you don't want us. I don't need to see him up in the top six. I'm fine nope. with him in the bottom and and go from there, and uh, we'll see what happens. But it's it's good to see him shooting. Forget, again, that he's got a hell of a shot as well. Well, and my problem is this, though. He always wants to win. Like, Johansson is cashing a paycheck. Every two weeks, goes to the bank, cashes his paycheck, gets the, his 20 bucks or so, goes home. <laughs> um, Ryan Hartman's not cashing a paycheck. What frustrates me is this. When he is contributing, he is a major intangible guy, though. And and it can be bottom six, but he can PK, can kill penalties really well. Like, he's got he's got that grinder mentality that I think is essential. It's why I said I think he'd be good on a Stanley Cup team. But like Jesse said, or like Declan said, when he decides that he's pissed and he does something stupid, it's like, what are you doing? You're not good <laughs> enough to do, you know? that That's what frustrates me is how do you harness the guy that Hines praised? And how can that, I mean... That, to me, take away the, the certainty of goals. If he just plays like he did last night and doesn't even score a goal, that's, that's what he could do every single night. And that's what I don't understand where that goes. Like mm-hmm. Johansson, I know, he's just loafing. Like last night, he tried a couple times. It's unbelievable. He could, the dude can skate. He's really good. He made a couple plays last night, but then he gets the puck all alone in the slot. And I don't know what he did, but it dribbled on goal. It looked like spit from a baby. 
You know, <laughs> like that's not, that's not, no, you can't do that. You're done. Um, Hart- Hartman's more con- confusing to me because Johansson, I know, is just not trying that hard. Hartman doesn't seem to know how to harness what he did last night consistently. And I'm slightly perplexed by that because that's the guy that D or that Bill Guerin signed to an extension. And yeah. a rant. And a rant. You sure? I just don't get it. <laughs> All right, when we talk next week, will, will we be talking? Will we be talking? It's last note on my player notes. I just want to get to that. Uh, will we be will we be still discussing a team that is close in the playoff race? Or will there be some more distance? I will say this. The problem with being behind the playoff race like the Wild is right now reared its ugly head in Seattle last night yep. where the Kraken and Golden Knights... Crackheads. Not only did the Golden Knights win, and it wasn't good if... Either team won, but the worst case was an overtime game, which yep. is what you got. So there were three points rewarded. So the Kraken picked up a point uh, with, I think, two games in hand. And the Golden Knights, who have a game in hand on the Wild, are still six points up. So, Jesse, next week, what will we be talking about when it comes to the Wild's playoff possibilities as we wind down the regular season? It feels like it's an every other week, right? Like this week we're on our high and the next week we're on our low. Um, but I think Minnesota is going to keep it on this high. They're going to keep you on the edge of your seat, on your toes. I think they're going to beat Anaheim. They're going to beat St. Louis and St. That's Louis. That's the big one. And that's okay. that is you're gonna have to win. You got St. Louis a bunch coming up. You need to win against St. Louis. You got two against Vegas. You need to win at least one against Vegas. I think we figured before yesterday's game, you need to go like seven, two, and one in your immediate future. And then you need to go like thirteen and four to close out the year. Just to get if you're figuring out points where Vegas might land. That ain't easy when you've got the you know, some of the teams on the schedule, but it could be. So we're gonna be talking playoffs still next week. Yeah. Because Minnesota's going to find a way to make us wait until the very godforsaken last game against Seattle. Not dead yet, Declan. Yeah, okay. that's I'm with. I completely agree with that. It's going to be a yin yang situation and probably come down to game 81 or 82, probably for mm-hmm. their playoff hopes. As a hockey fan, just as as a person that loves to watch the playoffs, I have no interest in the Wild beating out the Golden Knights. The Golden Knights are way more fun to watch. They they made that trade with the Sharks, right? They're going right. to have. Yeah. Like the Golden Knights. Mark Stone's going to return. Eichel's off of back. Eichel's back Oregon. now. Mark Stone, you talk about coming back from the dead. His spleen's going to be fine. Like I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> hey, tonight it's Freddie Goudreau against uh, the first. No, 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 no. I'm sorry about that. All right, Jesse, great stuff as always. Again, check out uh, Jesse Pierce's stuff. Bar down beauties. The podcast with uh, Kirsten Cole does a great job with that, and also check out her work NHL.com. She covers the Wild on a daily basis. He's Declan. I'm Judd. We'll see you later.